Then are you, are you ready to? Yeah, please. Okay, well then. All right, well, let me um, begin by welcoming everybody to our first uh, computational science and engineering seminar of the new semester and uh, our first virtual CSE seminar, since that's, that's how things are nowadays. Um, we're really pleased to have our first speaker uh, of the term, Professor Lin Lin from UC Berkeley. And uh, just a brief bio on Lin, he, he, he did his PhD in applied and computational mathematics at Princeton, uh, working with Wainan E and Roberto Carr, um, and then has been at Berkeley for most of the time since. Um, he's an associate professor of mathematics at UC Berkeley, and the faculty, faculty scientist in UC Berkeley Labs mathematics group within the computational research division. Um, his research interest focuses on a whole range of things, uh, ranging from numerical analysis, specifically in the context of uh, electronic structure calculations, um, quantum chemistry, quantum physics, and material science, and, and some new things that we'll learn about today in terms of quantum computing. Uh, Lynn has won a number of very prestigious awards, the Sloan Research Fellowship, the NSF Career Award, the DOE Early Career Award, the inaugural um, SIAM Computational Science Engineering Early Career Award, and recently the PKS Presidential Early Career Award for um, Scientists and Engineers. And um, one quote from Lynn's webpage that I found uh, sort of amusing and interesting, uh, and, and this, is, this is your words, but I'll say, it says, uh, Lynn says, I try to be a quantum chemist in disguise in the Department of Mathematics, but it appears that I'm an applied mathematician in the eyes of quantum chemists. Um, I think Lynn is one of the unique people who straddles both, and I really look forward to uh, his talk today. So please take it away. Oh, oh, thank you so much, Yusuf, for the very nice introduction. It is a such great pleasure for me to give this talk at MIT. I was indeed juggling between talking about electron structure and the talk about this is quite a new thing for me, and I decided to talk about this. Uh, one important reason is that MIT, I mean, it's a really great honor for me to talk about this topic at MIT, because uh, 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 really MIT plays uh, such a central role in quantum information theory and uh, many of these things. And I'm a rather newcomer uh, to this field, uh, started working on this relatively seriously about a year and a half ago. Maybe I, I hope this is also a good thing for the audience who is not so familiar with quantum sciences. Uh, this is a joint work with the three brilliant students, uh, Dong An, uh, Yulong Dong, and Yu Tong, uh, who are fifth year, fourth year, third year respectively right now. And uh, so really about a year and a half ago, I started saying, this looks an interesting field, but I don't know much about that. Are you guys interested? We look at this together. They are, were very brave and jumped on board and did a fabulous work. And especially Dong An, who's uh, really great. And uh, he is uh, on the job market this year and looking for postdoc positions. So uh, please uh, uh, keep an eye on him. So, uh, uh, so we start with uh, uh, MIT and uh, Feynman, and uh, so the field allegedly started uh, by Feynman in the first conference on physics and computation, which I guess fits the theme of CSE rather well, that's saying if you want to make a simulation of nature, what he specifically means, for example, electron structure, that kind of thing, and you'd better make it a quantum mechanical, so to build a quantum computer. So what does nature do? Uh, it basically involves the Schrodinger's equation, and here H is a many-body quantum Hamiltonian. So uh, uh, for most of the part, you can just think it's the H is a gigantic Hermitian matrix, and that would be good enough. So the solution is, because H is time independent, it is a, a unitary operator exponential minus IHT applied to initial vector for Psi, uh, psi zero. And uh, this exponential minus IHT, uh, you can denote it as a unitary matrix, and this is UT. So this is basically what nature does. So uh, uh, how do you do, use that for, uh, uh, like, uh, really to compute? Uh, so there's this famous Shor's algorithm, uh, and uh, uh, where, of course, uh, Peter Shor is at MIT. And uh, so you want to, for example, factorize, uh, like, uh, a number into p times q or p and q are prime numbers and uh, if you want to use a classical best algorithm i mean that scales a super polynomially with respect to the number of digits and uh, which is uh, which is a very very expensive uh, but uh, what peter shore uh, found was a very surprising uh, fact that if you indeed have a working quantum computer then the cost is only polynomial with respect to the number of digits so this was largely responsible for the so-called first wave of interest on quantum computing, 
But of course, later people realized that it would be pretty far away to build such a quantum computer, therefore the field uh, uh, went down a little bit. So it's uh, very similar to the ups and downs of machine learning that uh, the story many people are uh, familiar nowadays. So uh, then, uh, okay, can you hear me? Uh, somehow I was muted for a second. Yeah. Uh, okay, you can hear me. Great. Yeah. So, so I mean, there's really a long tradition uh, for uh, MIT to contribute to the quantum computation. The history is almost as long as the quantum computation itself. So, uh, there are just a few names and listed who made important contributions to this field. Uh, so, the, the, the next thing uh, is really the so called, in my perspective, is uh, like a quantum supremacy, where John Chris Gale from Caltech coined the term quantum supremacy in 2012. What it means, it describes a point where quantum computers can do things that classical computers cannot, regardless of whether these tasks are very are useful. This is very important, okay? So, so you, can, you can, let's say, a quantum computer can juggle like, a, like a, a 200 balls at the same time, while a classical computer can only juggle 11, then quantum computer is good. So, uh, but, but it, it wasn't clear whether this moderate goal can be achieved. Uh, so he famously asked the question, is controlling large scale quantum systems merely really, really hard or is it ridiculously hard? So uh, he also said, if we have such a computer then we're uh, in this uh, so-called noisy uh, intermediate scale quantum regime. Uh, so uh, 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 the the, the breaking news last year was quantum supremacy was reached. So the task was merely really, really hard. It was achieved by uh, the Google team using the 54 qubit machine, uh, NISC machine called the Sycamore. Uh, I won't talk about the details, uh, like uh, what is going on with the supremacy, uh, but uh, basically you want to find the probability of uh, bit strings from a very large random circuit. Uh, it's unclear what the application is, but it is a task that is specifically designed to be hard for classical computers and still implementable uh, like uh, through these experimental devices. Uh, and also interesting is that when a quantum computer can do something that is useful, because this is a nice term called the supremacy was already declared. So when it can do something useful is actually called something that is a, sounds like a more, much more moderate called the quantum advantage. So we are right now, I think, pretty solidly in the so-called second wave of interest on in quantum computing, and uh, you hear all sorts of news and, uh, on this topic. So what is a quantum computer mathematically? Uh, it basically says that you, you start from a vector that is uh, uh, like a capital N complex numbers. Conveniently, let's write capital N to be two to the small n, where this small n is the number of qubits. So uh, you have access to certain, not definitely not every, certain unitary matrices of size C capital N by capital N, so that this U times any psi is easy, is efficient to apply. This is what quantum computer does. This is something that a classical computer can struggle a lot, but quantum computer just does it by nature. So what you want to do is really to design a series of this use, u1, u2, un, apply to some vectors and then do something like a measurement or other things. And uh, so, so this procedure, it should in principle cost, uh, the cost would be poly n. So poly with respect to, uh, the, or the ideal that a speed up would be like a poly n. Uh, but since n is already, capital N is already exponential with respect to small n, so this in principle can provide some exponential speed up with respect to any classical computer. So this is the promise at least. So uh, in terms of the language, uh, uh, the algorithms uh, are usually written in terms of uh, the so-called quantum circuit. It's nothing but a graphical way of doing writing down linear algebra. Everything is linear algebra. So you, it's, it's a, uh, very similar to, in some sense, to like, like, <laughs> like, a, like a music. 
where you start from a, a, a zero state, and then you gradually put the gates there and uh, they would uh, transform the, uh, the classical state or the quantum state into something different. So there are some uh, one qubit gates, there are two qubit gates, and blah, 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 and in the end they do some merriment. So let me uh, spend, uh, since I expect most of you to have a very uh, 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 like a, uh, have a no background on this. So I'm really going to start from uh, something that's uh, like uh, uh, basic. Uh, so let's say we, we look at the state vectors. We define this as when we write zero, it means uh, uh, one zero in C2. If we put a one, it means a zero one. Then there are a few important so-called a single qubit. This is a single qubit, single qubit matrix. So there are X, uh, there is a y, 0 minus i, i, 0. There's a z, 1, 0, 0 minus i. So these are called the poly matrices. So when I apply this matrix to a vector, the notation is the vector to be applied to is on the left. I apply this uh, matrix here and transform this. So 0, 1, 1, 0 times 1, 0 becomes 0, 1. So x transforms 0 to 1. Similarly, z transforms 1 to minus 1, so on and so forth. Uh, so there are uh, some uh, more like like uh, uh, slightly more complicated things like the Hartmann gate. So this is the base matrix applied to zero, one zero gives you uh, one over square root of two, one one, and this is called the plus state. So uh, uh, the notation H transformed to zero to plus, and you also have this C naught gate, which is uh, basically a quantum controlled knot. So you can find many more, uh, like in the classical textbook by Nielsen and uh, Professor Isaac Tron at MIT. Or, I mean, you can, uh, if you want to know more, you can simply take a course from many of these uh, experts at MIT. So uh, what is quantum linear algebra? Uh, it's basically saying you want to solve uh, linear systems, eigenvalue problems, matrix of exponentials, these square problems, singular value decomposition, et cetera, et cetera, on the quantum computer. And just in the past few years, there have been many interesting, exciting progresses in the past few years on the development of these algorithms. Uh, and uh, it's a, you can say it's a reasonable way towards quantum advantage, because uh, if you can do some of these tasks there, on the quantum computer, then uh, indeed the quantum computer is doing something that's useful compared to classical computers, and if the quantum computer can do it faster. Uh, they're somewhat also related to a field called quantum machine learning, which is a field to be defined. Uh, I, I, throughout the talk, I will focus mostly on the problem of the solving linear systems, because uh, it's really where we start learning linear algebra. This is classically how I write it down, AX equals to B. The quantum linear system problem, or QLSP, is almost the same thing, which means you give me a state that's normalized, uh, B, uh, the right-hand side, that's a quantum state. I uh, want to find another normalized state. Quantum mechanics only works with the normalized states. So a normalized state so that A times X is a proportional to B. So this is uh, what, it, what it means to solve a quantum linear system problem. So, uh, I find this field really fascinating because uh, uh, they're, they're really, uh, it, it's a completely different way of like thinking, it provides a completely different way of thinking about the problems. And many of the algorithms, they don't look at all like, uh, like the, the, the classical counting class. And uh, we looked at, I mean, as I said, I really started doing this about a year and a half ago, but we already found many interesting things and uh, still there are many more, I guess, to be discovered. Uh, we worked on uh, like uh, some near optimal uh, QO, uh, like uh, quantum linear system solver. Uh, uh, near optimal means almost reaching comple computational complexity lower bound, uh, like uh, using techniques called adiabatic quantum computing, but not straightforwardly. Uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about this later in the second half of the talk. Uh, there's a, another uh, more algebraic uh, uh, construction called eigenstate filtering. Uh, and uh, uh, we found, again, near optimal certain, uh, in certain sense, the ground state and the ground energy solver. That is very much related to the electronic structure problem. Uh, and uh, there is a, a very interesting development in the past three years called the quantum signal processing. 
And uh, uh, there is an important question there is called how to find the phase factors. Uh, so we, we, we found some algorithms that does much better than the state of the art. And uh, there is uh, uh, also many of you might heard about uh, the so-called classical link pack. And uh, the, the, well, you might ask, well, what's the quantum version of the link pack? How does it work? Uh, or like uh, in classically, there is a preconditioning, but uh, how, what, what is the quantum uh, like uh, uh, setup of the preconditioning? So, so you can ask many of these questions and the answers, uh, some of them are more straightforward. Some of them are, are uh, much less so. So I, I have had a lot of fun uh, in this field in the, past, uh, uh, in the past year or so. So this talk is not gonna focus on this. Uh, because I realized that in order to give a relatively self-contained talk, uh, like it's a, 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 it's actually requires a lot of preparation to talk about this uh, detailed results. Instead, I'm going to focus a lot of my time uh, talking about a rather concrete toy example, uh, which is a two by two matrix. Okay, so it sounds a little bit stupid, which is a you, you want to use a quantum computer to solve AX equals to B where A is a two by two matrix. It's actually not that simple. Uh, and there are multiple ways of doing so. But the approach I'm gonna talk about, which sounds, uh, may sound a little bit bizarre at the beginning, has two advantages. One is it's one of the most recent developments. And uh, it really gives you a rather concise quantum circuit that is even implementable on near term devices. And the second is, although I'm talking about two by two, the principle can be applied to general n qubit matrices. So it's two by two in that sense is merely a way so that you can see every step what is going on. So I, I pick this particular matrix because uh, one quarter x plus three quarters times identity, which is this very like innocent matrix. So uh, B is just a, a zero. So it's the, like a one zero. And I want to solve this. Uh, a, I want to solve A inverse B. So X and I, they're unitaries. Uh, you can directly encode, uh, I don't need to do anything X, there is a, a gate called X. Uh, uh, so this you can directly implement like on quantum computers. But A is a linear combination of unitary or LCU, uh, and, uh, but itself is not a unitary matrix. The first question is how do you get this matrix A into a quantum computer? Okay, I mean, we have to, to solve this, we have to solve that problem. And this problem is also very, very well conditioned, uh, kappa A equals to two, but of course I can tune this coefficient to make it arbitrarily more well conditioned or less well conditioned. So uh, idea, there are many ideas to get this A into a quantum computer, but the one idea that is particularly, I, I find it uh, generalizable, is to just extend this non-unitary matrix a little bit. Let's say from this one qubit matrix, I make two qubit matrix called the UA, so that the A I am interested in is located on the upper left corner of this UA. So, so this UA, I can think is a two qubit or four by four matrix. Uh, this UA itself is unitary. And this A is here, this two by two thing here. Okay, the question is whether you can do it. And uh, uh, the name of this procedure is called the block encoding because you, you encode this A as a block matrix to a larger unitary. Uh, well, for this example, I can just construct one. How I constructed that is less important is, uh, is uh, the detail. There is a principle of the procedure, but it's a, a little bit mouthful to say, but uh, you can feel free to check that this is indeed a unitary and this is exactly the A I promised before. So uh, new can be viewed as a mapping on uh, like a two qubit, so two copies of C2. And uh, in the uh, like a, a quantum notation, uh, it's a zero, because uh, this is a, like a, the, you can think in terms of a tensor product times identity, and there's a bra, there's a cat notation, and this is given A. This exactly means I'm taking the upper left block of uh, this UA. Then, because uh, uh, this is zero, what do I, if, if I really want to have access to this A, what, what do I do? So the input should be zero, this, this is zero. 
the output, I do a measurement. If there's one, I discard this. But if the zero means that, bingo, I got the upper left block, then the output will be a times psi upon measuring the result and get the zero. So if this is the first time you see it, it does take a little time to think about this procedure, but uh, uh, I, uh, like, like uh, maybe it's a good time for me to pause a bit and ask if there's any question. Okay, so. Uh, Sorry, yeah. um, can I ask why we do block encoding? Doesn't it, like if we only need that block, why can't we just save that block? Great question. So the problem is on quantum computer, everything, everything in the end must be unitary. The quantum computer only does one thing, which is do this unitary evolution or that unitary evolution. It doesn't do anything else. So in order to any, do anything that is non-unitary, you have to trick the quantum computer to do the job. Does it make sense? Oh, okay. Yeah, please. I, I mean, if this is the first time you see it, probably many things feel very unnatural. I definitely feel that, feel that way. Okay, so this UA will, will gonna call it as an oracle. It means that I don't care anymore. I mean, maybe I know how exactly to construct this oracle, but from now on, I don't care how I constructed this UA. I wanna use this UA as a building Lego block to build algorithm that gives me access to a inverse in a similar fashion. So the inverse matrix you can compute it directly and it's this matrix. Note that here's the important thing. So the A inverse, the operator norm is two, which is bigger than one. What's the big deal of that? It means that there's absolutely no hope to put this A inverse as a sub matrix block of another unitary because of the unitary matrix is a, a, a norm, operator norm one, any sub matrix blocks must have operator norm that is smaller than or equal to one. So this one has the operator norm equal to two, so there's no hope to do this. So uh, the remedy is that we can uh, do something that is almost as good. That is we divide this A inverse by a big number alpha, where alpha is to be chosen, so that A inverse divided by alpha has an operator norm that is smaller than or equal to one, so that it can, there's any, some chance to put this A inverse divided by alpha to the upper left block of another unitary matrix UA inverse. So the goal of the quantum algorithm is to construct this unitary UA inverse using UA, UA dagger, and some other simple case. In this case, UA is UA dagger, so it's uh, simple. And uh, to construct uh, this uh, uh, UA inverse, okay? First, let me show this UA inverse exists. And uh, again, this is unitary, and I promise I not only constructed this problem, but using explicitly with the promise I said before, only use this a simple building block. I didn't have access to, access to any other things. I can construct such a UA inverse, which is an eight by eight matrix. Uh, probably we cannot do it with four by four, but uh, it's eight by eight matrix, so that the upper left here is this matrix that is uh, I choose alpha equal to 20, A inverse divided by alpha is exactly this. So you measure again the zero qubit and, uh, uh, and uh, like uh, an so-called ancilla qubit and you will uh, like uh, uh, get access to this. Here we use the two ancilla. So whenever I, uh, all the other matrices, I don't care about them and uh, I just uh, throw them away. This is the procedure. Uh, you're not expected to understand this procedure but I just want to write down what it looks like. Uh, first of all, at least to me, it doesn't look like any classical, either direct or iterative algorithm. And uh, you took the, took the course from uh, uh, Alan Edelman or uh, Gilbert Strand or other uh, uh, distinguished uh, applied mathematicians and, uh, and you learn all the like uh, conjugate gradient or Gauss elimination or sparse direct, any of those, they don't like, look like these algorithms at all. So uh, the, the, the uh, basically start from your B, uh, B1, B2, as I said, they're like a two ancilla qubits. Uh, you do some weird stuff. Let me go through this very quickly, okay? As I said, you're not meant to understand this. 
uh, you apply Hardman gate. Uh, like uh, for each step, you apply so-called uh, some uh, like a, uh, like a, a certain uh, you do a so-called phase rotation where there's a phi uh, like uh, there's a phi phase factor, and uh, then you apply a UA. And then apply another phase factor, apply UA, apply another phase factor, apply UA. And then in the end, you apply Hadamard gate, you measure, and then you're done. Okay. So, so it's, a, it's a very weird procedure. Now, there are some technical caveats uh, saying this is a, already a simplified procedure. But uh, what I want to say is this is a generic procedure. I, I use this procedure to solve a two by two matrix. If this matrix is of size a billion by a billion, it's still the same procedure. Uh, so uh, the phase factors are rather important. And uh, uh, so uh, I, I want to say that it's a kind of hard for me to um, uh, like answer questions uh, like uh, by looking at the chat. You can either unmute yourself, ask me now, or you can save the questions to the end of the talk. Any yes, question? Question yeah. about that. Yeah. Uh, about that example you showed, right? So yeah. one, one more slide back. Um, you know, what, what, what you show has some zero blocks in there, right? So yeah. I was just kind of wondering whether, you know, it was shown that this is the optimal way to, to make this, you know, a bigger matrix, you know, or whether whether it's known whether this algorithm just generates the smallest forms of the unitary transformation or whether, you know, sometimes it could be made better. Oh, uh, no claim of, of a great question. So no claim of optimality so far. And this factors, everything, uh, this factors in particular can be improved. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, I would say two ancilla qubits is already very good. Actually any O1 ancilla qubits is considered to be good because many other schemes, they need to use a log N or log one or epsilon or this kind of a number of qubits, which is way larger. So two okay. is considered to be really good. So uh, yeah, so so there are definitely other algorithms to do this, which which are to me more complicated and uh, less transparent to show in this self-contained fashion. Any other question? Uh, I was just thinking that it seemed like an opportunity to use the CS decomposition to get the bigger matrix. Oh, great question. So the thanks, Alan. So the the CS decomposition indeed is very much related to this, but the important thing. We can definitely talk about it later. The important thing is you must use these oracles and uh, some simple gates like X, Y, Z to construct the algorithm. Indeed, for if you just want uh, like uh, some block encoding, then a CS decomposition would be very useful, but uh, it may not necessarily be easy to implement. Uh, I, I also have a question. Um, I noticed that A is symmetric, so I was wondering if uh, uh, that is an impact in the construction of like UA and UA minus one or great observation. Like a great observation. Any symmetry, uh, even I make this procedure simplified, I even say this positive definite, none of them matters uh, in the end, but uh, they all require some sort of modifications. In particular, you can solve linear systems with the, uh, the uh, most up-to-date techniques uh, uh, relative, using almost the same algorithm uh, for general, uh, even non-symmetric uh, matrix A. But uh, Hermitian things simplifies the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, is the dimension of the matrix depends on the number of cubics? Uh, that's correct. So the dimension of matrix A, which is a small n, uh, uh, or uh, sorry, the dimension of the matrix A is two to the small n. Uh, so let's say n is uh, 10 and uh, the dimension of the matrix A is uh, two to the 10, which is uh, 1,024. Okay. Yeah, but uh, you can see when n becomes 50, this is a two to the 50, which is obviously very large. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, so yeah. Question. Um, is there a relationship between the dimension of the uh, uh, inverse unitary and the, uh, the original uh, unitary matrix? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the unitary what here, the what does two ancilla qubits mean? It means that if the original matrix is of size 2 to the n, then this UA inverse is 2 to the n plus 2. It's not okay. 2 to the 2n, it's not something more. It's a, Precisely two to the n plus two. Okay, that's great. Yeah, thanks.
Okay, so I'll proceed uh, then. Uh, so the uh, thanks for the questions. I think uh, it's uh, much better to uh, understand uh, uh, this uh, this part and then the later part of the talk. So uh, so uh, uh, so the uh, just to show you an example, if I do it at 80 steps, these are the shape of the phase factors. They have very interesting decay behavior, which again, if you're interested, I can talk more. Yeah, I, I, they're intimately connected to the smoothness of the functions you are approximating. And uh, uh, the, uh, this is just to show you that, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, if you really want to check uh, the error, like A inverse divided by alpha with the numerically exact one, they really can converge to 10 to the minus 11. Well, I make this uh, phase factor a little bit longer and uh, they can converge to even higher accuracy. So this is a really a legitimate algorithm. So the previous slide is, a, I mean, a long list of things. Uh, this one, has a lot, I mean, it seems to be much more concise and has a lot more structure. That is why quantum circuit is a useful language when you write down quantum algorithm. Circuits and algorithms are really synonymous to each other. And uh, in this field, uh, you apply some Hadamard, you have some C naught, you have some rotation, some C naught, some UA, UA again, da da da, in the end, you marry these two ancillary qubits, then the, there is a performance guarantee that if the quantum computer works, this gives you. A inverse divided by alpha times psi. So you solve the quantum linear system problem. Uh, as I said, the same circuit works for arbitrarily large matrix uh, and uh, with the uh, I mean, technical things. If A is not Hermitian, you, there are some modifications needs to be done. So this is a special case of uh, the recently developed something called a quantum signal processing by Lowe and uh, Isaac Tron. And uh, Lowe was a also former student of uh, uh, Professor Trump, uh, like uh, at uh, Felix, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, also called the quantum singular value decomposition QSVT, uh, and uh, as you can see, the paper was only published last year. It's a very recent stuff, uh, and uh, this one I'm quoting again from uh, Isa uh, that uh, this is uh, uh, when he was uh, uh, like uh, organizing a talk at the Simons Institute at Berkeley that this is one of the most interesting developments this QSVT in quantum algorithms in the past decade. And I personally very much agree so. It is really a very versatile uh, way of thinking about a whole range of quantum algorithms, especially in quantum linear algebra. And what it actually does is something, again, very interesting is a polynomial eigenvalue transformation and, uh, and also singular value transformation with a definite parity. So th there's a, like, a, a lot uh, packed into this sentence Again, if you're interested, I would be happy to talk more uh, offline. So uh, uh, there is still the question. I mean, I gave you this A, which seems to be very artificial. Uh, in order to do something on a real quantum device, uh, I mean, how do you get this matrix A into computer anyway? Uh, so uh, there are many ways. And uh, let's say I want to do a lean pack. OK, what is a lean pack classically? Uh, it's a, you do a, generate a pseudo random matrix A and you want to solve A of X equals to B and uh, use uh, some direct methods. So uh, the, uh, what if I want to do the analog on the quantum computer? If you first generate the pseudo random matrix and throw that into the like a quantum computer, then this is, uh, this is uh, actually uh, uh, very inefficient. Uh, actually, it's a very questionable whether you can do this with a poly n cost at all. But what we propose here, uh, called a random circuit block encoded matrix, uses exactly the same idea of block encoding I talked about earlier. And we think it's a, really a proper generalization of random matrices in the quantum linear algebra setup. The setup is extremely simple and it's a very flexible way for you to construct a matrix. So let's say uh, I want to construct a non-unitary unitary random matrix A, uh, but now we take into account some physical constraints. There is a so-called coupling map. What it means is if you get access to a quantum computer, this is uh, IBM's one of the open uh, uh, like uh, to public quantum computer five qubit. So the zero qubit is only coupled to the first qubit. First qubit the couple to the second, the first couple to the third, so on and so forth, but definitely not like an auto connection. Any of the near term devices over the foreseeable for the foreseeable future, there should be such a coupling map. So if you want to implement 
let's say, a two qubit operation between zero and three, you have to essentially go through zero and one, one and three, and which significantly increases the error. So in order to construct a random matrix, what you can do is the following procedure. I just throw some random gates, some so-called U1, U2, C0 gates, uh, and the form such a like a big random unitary, it's a four qubit unitary. I leave this one out for uh, some purposes later. So I generate a four qubit unitary. I just take the first qubit. I measure that has to be zero. I can postpone the measure. It doesn't need to be literally. I measure that on the spot, and then I generate this a three qubit uh, non-unitary matrix. So this is a chaotic random circuit. This is a cartoon. I take the upper left block, it's a truncated unitary, and which is this random circuit block included matrix. And as you can see, you give me this copy map, I can just uh, respect this copy map to generate this uh, random circuit. So it's very flexible. And in, if this copy map is general, uh, you can prove uh, that uh, you can in principle get access to any uh, 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 non-unitary matrix up to a scale. So, you, you can then use this to solve linear systems. So there are still a few steps involved, but the basic procedure is the th same thing as I said earlier. So you have some uh, matrix, here's a Hermitianized version of the matrix. I apply this to some uh, uh, initial vector that's called zero qubit n, zero, 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 zero n of them. And uh, this is the result that you actually solve on the IBM uh, 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 IBM quantum computer. So these are like a, a few five qubit machines. They can allow you to use up to 20 or like 50 qubits. Uh, they are very noisy in the sense that if you look at, let's say, measure the success through the so-called, uh, uh, through this number called the success probability, it doesn't look like success probability, but uh, if you write, go through the procedure, you can, uh, you can uh, like uh, reformulate this as a success probability. So this p measured minus the exact value, the the the, the 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 accuracy is definitely not 10 to the minus 10, but it's not like a completely noisy either. You do get some like a 20% or so uh, error. Uh, and also depends on the number of phase factors you use. If you use a larger number of phase factors, then the noise accumulate exponentially, and uh, so so uh, you'll get uh, like a much worse result. Uh, so in that sense, it's a, a, a near term is a much more controllable to do, do this on a quantum virtual machine, where you can uh, see that uh, for different kappas, and uh, you uh, uh, if there is no noise, the solution can be very accurate. But if there is full noise, of course, the result become much worse. So. Uh, the code is publicly available, and uh, you can download this uh, code uh, called a QSP pack, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's very easy to use, and uh, you just uh, register uh, IBM like uh, free, uh, account for free, and uh, you can uh, either run it on IBM's machine or just uh, run locally on your quantum simulator. Uh, so I said this is a quantum linear algebra. Uh, it's uh, definitely not uh, restricted to solve linear systems. If you want to do uh, solve other uh, tasks, which can be expressed as matrix function, the procedure is almost exactly the same. You can use this to do time propagation, and there's no trotterization going on here. Uh, and uh, you can do the rat for the for this, uh, or you can do the spectral matter, which, for example, you convert this to a linear system problem. Uh, where uh, you represent this delta through the plan A formula as a, like uh, inverse with some broad broadening, and you solve this non Hermitian uh, uh, problem. And uh, you can get access to the spectral density or the density of states corresponding to this uh, random matrix. So uh, there are some thermal energies. So let, let me skip this part. So let me just uh, pause a bit and saying that what kind of uh, uh, thing I often get, well, uh, the, through the limited times I give in front of a math audience. Uh, I mean, uh, people ask, like, is quantum linear algebra a real thing? Uh, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> no, because it uh, really works with a complex arithmetic. Yes, is I do think that's a real thing. Uh, and how do you act to get the matrix vectors like into the quantum computer? Uh, there's a, this is the 
uh, really infamous reading problem. Red band, I, the reason why I talk about the thing there is just to show you that you can indeed, in a relatively legitimate way, construct uh, like a, a big, like uh, uh, n qubit matrix and still solve it with a quantum computer. But there are many other techniques to get this matrix A into a quantum computer as well. Depends on what kind of A, it really depends on what kind of A you have. Which quantity do you measure? If you measure like, a, like a, a all the outputs, the cost is again, exponential to N, then you're absolutely right. It definitely don't matter everything. When you read out, you need to think very carefully what you want to get. And usually in the end, you want to get access to some success probabilities or access to samples. How do you know the answer is correct? So this is another very difficult problem, you know, which is quantum verification. But in the case of a quantum linear algebra, you can think that either uh, you have some a priori performance guarantee because you have some good error bound, uh, or you can do some a posteriori uh, verification. But I want to say all of these questions, uh, there is no simple answer to that. And uh, there's, there's a very active field of research going on. So uh, is there any question before I move on? Um, uh, I just have a question, uh, actually yeah. two questions. First question is, uh, do you need to have the uh, matrix A inverse uh, so that your algorithm works? Uh, or um, how you compute alpha uh, actually? Yeah, so th those are, uh, I mean, uh, uh, really depends from case to case, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, the alpha you, you have uh, you can do some estimate. We can talk offline about this. And uh, you, do you need a inverse? You do. Actually, uh, you sh it's more productive to just to think a inverse is a matrix function of a. So you know, the the procedure to get a inverse allows you to also get essentially f a applied to b as a matrix function. Uh, uh, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive to me because if you ha need to have a invert, then you already solve the problem. Uh, no, this is really a, it is indeed counterintuitive, but the way is uh, is exactly the opposite of the, what you do in numerical linear algebra. In numerical linear algebra, we say we do LU factors. They never compute the a inverse if you just want to uh, want to uh, uh, solve a linear system. In quantum computer, you have to get access to A inverse in order to solve the linear system. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah, there, there are many counterintuitive things going on here. So uh, any other question? Okay, so I'm uh, more or less, I'm close to running out of time, but let me quickly say some more theoretical results on quantum linear system problem without going into the details. So uh, let's uh, look at this uh, QLSP problem uh, a little bit more abstractly. So uh, first of all, as I said, all vectors need to be normalized. I have a matrix A and uh, normalized in this sense. So in the small L2 in the product, it uh, normalized to be one. And I want to find a solution vector so that it's A inverse B divided by a normalization phase factor. How to get A and B to a quantum computer? I've just shown you two concrete examples how to do that. But generally, this reading problem is not easy to solve at all. And uh, you do need the, uh, uh, so we assume that this U block encoding UA is already, you can access to that through a block encoding. And we want to count the so-called query complexity, which is the number of oracles to UA that you use. So to talk about quantum speed up, there are two important uh, like uh, uh, numbers. One is kappa, the condition number of A, and the other is epsilon, or the target accuracy. So the, with some proper assumptions, let's say A is a certain good D sparse matrix that you can know how to deal with. And the Oracle, there are some known implementations of a certain UA that causes poly M. So, uh, so at least for class of problems, this, is set, uh, this could be satisfied. The groundbreaking work was by Harrow at MIT, Hatha Demon, uh, Seth Lloyd, again, MIT, uh, like in 2009, showing that uh, there exists an algorithm using the so-called phase estimation algorithm uh, to achieve poly n kappa square over epsilon accuracy. With respect to n, this is already exponential speed up. With respect to kappa, this is a horrible, because uh, even the steep descent algorithm 
it scales us all the kappa, which usually in numerical linear algebra we say it is slow. And uh, with a conjugate gradient, usually it's the square root of kappa. So uh, in the past few years, there have been significant advance, uh, advances to reduce the uh, dependence on uh, this uh, uh, target accuracy, epsilon, because the one over epsilon is also not fast at all. You can improve that to polylog kappa over epsilon using the you know, linear, uh, linear combination unitary technique, or recently using this uh, QSP and QSVT and uh, uh, give you another kappa square polylog kappa over epsilon type of result. Compared to the classical iterative solvers, and you cannot compare with the direct. As far as I know, there is no analog of Gauss elimination uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the quantum world. Uh, so if you deal with a positive, de uh, positive definite matrix and measure the error in the A norm, then the steepest descent, it scales with N, uh, if it's a, it's a D sparse, uh, which means two to the small N, uh, but the kappa log one or epsilon, the conjugate gradient is even better. So quantum algorithms, they scale better in N, but much worse in kappa. And uh, uh, there's also a known lower bound, again, in uh, showing the HHL paper, that uh, for generic linear system, we do not expect that there exists a quantum solver to achieve order kappa to the one minus delta complexity with any delta that is bigger than zero. So the goal of the so-called near optimal quantum linear system solver is poly n kappa uh, polylog kappa over epsilon. So this is uh, really what you, the best you can get. Uh, this is uh, a big table, uh, like uh, summarizing the uh, progress, uh, a lot of the progresses in the past few years, starting from HHL and uh, to QSP, QSVT, and also a recent algorithm by Rolando Soma, the collaborators called the randomization method, which achieved. Uh, so this is the first one that achieves the generically order kappa uh, accuracy, uh, uh, order kappa complexity without this kappa square. And uh, uh, in the past uh, year, we also uh, like uh, made, pro made progress that uh, uh, so sorry so there's a phone call so uh, so uh, made progress in the using the so-called arithmetic quantum computing and eigenfield uh, state filtering with uh, some uh, uh, convenience and advantages which are a bit technical I won't go into the detail here so uh, yeah let me just use a few minutes and talk about the uh, the very big picture, the idea going on here in the adiabatic quantum computing, because uh, I, I really find this uh, rather interesting, is a, is a beautiful idea that uh, uh, was uh, proposed by, uh, like in this paper by uh, Subashi Somana Osuki, and it says, originally you want to solve a linear system problem, but you don't solve that. You solve a transformed eigenvalue problem, right? It just sounds a bit crazy. Because uh, usually we know solving eigenvalue problem is more difficult than solving uh, like a linear system. But no, you, you solve an eigenvalue problem instead. It actually waves together the ideas from linear systems, eigenvalue problems, and differential equations all together. So the idea is very simple. So I, uh, you give me a vector called b, and I want to solve ax equals to b. I construct a projection operator called the QB that is I minus BB transpose, okay? B is auto, uh, autonomous, so this is the projection operator. So if AX equals to B is correct, I can apply QB to the left so that QB AX is just a QB B, but this is a projecting out of the contribution from B, so this is zero. So uh, almost equivalently, AX equals B means that QB AX equal to zero. What does this mean? It means that if I can look at this formation matrix, so it's a, uh, I introduce one and see qubit. So this is zero, A QB, QB A. And my solution vector is the tensor product of zero and X or in the block form X and zero. Then you look at the null space of H. You look at the null space of H, you find that this X tilde is in the null space of H because you just multiply this zero times that, A QBA times that is zero, QBA times X, this it is also zero. So uh, there is another null space vector, which is a kind of trivial and uh, uh, you don't care about it anyway. 
So the problem of solving quantum linear system problem becomes a problem of a finding the eigenvector of H with the eigenvalue zero. So, uh, uh, okay. So the idea is to use adiabatic quantum computation means that I don't know how to get access to this eigenvector of H of one, but I want to start with something that is really simple called H zero. So uh, for which I do know eigenstate and I slowly drive this eigenstate from Psi zero to Psi one. So, uh, so the idea is really old. Uh, I mean, it started from uh, like a, like a, a ball and a fork. Basically, it's, uh, uh, in the 19, like 20s, a physical system remains in its instantaneous eigenstate if a given perturbation is acting slowly enough and there's a gap. And in the past uh, almost a century, many mathematicians and physicists have worked out to justify and make this more and more concise. But basically, if you care about a subspace that is gapped away from the rest of the things, you can do a quantum dynamics that is slow enough and drive the state from one eigenstate to another. The punchline here is if you do this ex explicitly, the result is very bad. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, how should I say? So, the, if you do this explicitly, then the, the complexity is even worse than kappa square. It's actually a kappa cube with a, a divided by epsilon. So it's just a horrible algorithm. And what we did was really to find that this kappa cube can be entirely removed just to do a very simple modification. The very simple modification is you do a so-called rescheduling step so you still follow this so-called adiabatic path. You still follow this adiabatic path, but you somehow make the dynamics go a little bit slower at the beginning and a little bit slower at the end in the following the well-defined schedule. And then what you can prove is, well, then what you can prove is that, uh, uh, let's say this is the simplified version where A is uh, uh, like a positive definite with a condition number kappa, then for large enough kappa uh, t that is uh, uh, bigger than zero, the error, uh, which is what you want, uh, like uh, the, the, the density matrix that you get in the end, minus the thing that you want, is really scaling as, uh, up to some uh, log factors. This is uh, like exponential minus c, where this is kappa over t. Or if you think about the runtime of the dynamics is near optimal is uh, kappa times polylog kappa times a polylog one over epsilon factor. So the rich is near optimal complexity and uh, you can also generalize to non hermitian matrices as well. So let me just uh, conclude. Uh, sorry, I jumped uh, pretty quickly for the last step, but uh, I say, uh, thought like uh, if uh, this is the first time quantum talk, you get probably the last thing is a uh, lot, second part is a pretty condensed anyway. But I want to say that I think we're really in a very exciting time uh, that, uh, that we, we do have access to like uh, some, uh, some, some quantum computers that are not great, they're not error corrected. Uh, and getting this error corrected large scale quantum computers probably is really, really, really hard in the near future. But you can already play with these computers and uh, get some uh, like uh, interesting observations. So it is actually fun to think both in terms of these near-term devices, uh, as I shown earlier for the RACBAM, and but also long-term devices, uh, uh, which is uh, this uh, quantum algorithms. Uh, so from approximation theory perspective, this uh, recently developed quantum signal processing technique is a uh, it really gives a very interesting problem, which is polynomial approximation theory in SU2. I would be happy to talk about that, like if you're interested offline. And there are uh, you know, like intricate like uh, connections between the decay of these phase factors and the smoothness of the functions. I think it's still to be uh, 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 to be uh, like uh, uh, revealed. And uh, recently, we're also working on some uh, like a truncated uh, the statistics of this random circular block encoded matrix is related to trun uh, like a truncated, truncated random unitaries and associated classical hardness problems. And uh, we're also interested in some faster thermostate preparation. I wanna say that, uh, I mean, uh, I'm a, uh, uh, 
really glad to be part of this uh, new uh, ASF Quantum Leap Challenge Institute to be happening in the next uh, five years, and which is a big collaboration between Berkeley, Simons Institute, MIT, and many other schools. And uh, there are not that many mathematicians yet in this community, and which I think why there is a big potential. As you can see, uh, I mean, many of them there have been working on quantum throughout their uh, uh, their, their their career. I'm a little bit embarrassed to be in this group because I'm so new to the uh, field. And uh, but uh, if you really look, uh, 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 Thomas Vidic uh, is uh, in uh, uh, CMS at the Caltech, but he was uh, trained at the ESCS, uh, like at the Berkeley. Uh, and uh, I mean, the, other than me, the other one who's really associated with the math department is really Peter Short. So I'm uh, really quite uh, uh, embarrassed. Uh, but I, I really think there is a lot of opportunities as well, and um, from the perspective of a classical numerical analyst and numerical people working on numerical linear algebra. Finally, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lin. Um, um, very interesting presentation. Um, it's one o'clock already, so um, for those who have um, uh, classes or other appointments to attend, uh, we understand if you go. Uh, for those who can kind of hang around, maybe we can spend uh, five minutes for some questions. Um, you can um, use chat or you can raise your hand, but um, I would uh, need Professor Lin to stop sharing the screen so that I can see everyone. Um, any questions? Nicola, can I ask uh, a question? Sure. Um, so uh, if I understand correctly that uh, the algorithm you propose need uh, A inverse, um, I'm wondering is there other quantum algorithm that need A inverse to, to be able to solve the linear system? Uh, essentially, all the algorithm I'm aware of, they are constructing the A inverse. That's the short answer. So they're just constructing A inverse one way or another. Okay, thanks. So James wanted to ask a question. Uh, yeah, um, I'm intrigued by the um, simple toy problem that you presented at the very Great. beginning. Um, this, th the question I have is uh, one of the uniqueness of the, um, th let's call it the larger matrix that you developed from the uh, initial matrix. It strikes me that it's probably not unique. Um, nope. And also, um, is there a set of tools to generate that matrix uh, efficiently uh, from the outset? Um, and what about the uniqueness? Uh, is that an advantage or just, I mean, the fact that it's not, a, not unique, is that an, uh, an advantage in the sense of having a variety of tools that can get you to the full matrix or what? Okay, great question. So the, the answer is, uh, as far as I know, it's not unique. And different algorithms uh, like uh, provide very different block encodings, although uh, the block encoding language was only developed in the past two, three years or so. Before they were called all sorts of other things, but intrinsically uh, from a linear algebra perspective, they're doing block encoding. So uh, like uh, 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 there are, as I said uh, earlier, there are other techniques that uses, let's say, log one or epsilon, those uh, like a number of qubits, which means you have a two to the log one or epsilon going on there, and uh, some other techniques. Uh, like uh, the, the, So the fact that the algorithm I proposed, uh, presented there, only uses two ancillary qubits, I think that's a, a very big advantage. Uh, you mm -hmm. can ask whether it is possible to use only one ancillary qubit. Uh, I can only say that to the extent of my knowledge, I don't know such an I don't know such algorithm yet, but I, I'm not aware of any lower bound either. Uh, in, in particular, you have the following almost a trivial result. You give me any non-unitary matrix A, any non-unitary matrix A, I can always build uh, n plus one qubit, uh, n qubit non-unitary matrix A, I can always build uh, n plus one qubit unitary matrix so that the upper left block is A divided by alpha. So in that sense, uh, it's a, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it, it's probably hard to show that the two is uh, the optimal one, 
Uh, so you sh uh, it's better to think two is more like uh, uh, like a, a number that you introduce in the classical algorithm as temporary variable, or whatever other things, and uh, think of it as a part of the algorithm. Can I just add one more comment? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it strikes me uh, that you, the problem you're dealing with is kind of the inverse of another problem, which is um, what we call effective operator theory in, in mm -hmm. nuclear many-body theory, where you actually start with some large system and you try to reduce it to an effective small system. Uh, many different languages for doing that, but there are mathematical tools established over the years for carrying out that process. And it's all designed to give you spectrally equivalent reduced matrices. And a lot of studies have been done on such approaches. But anyway, just a curious way I would have of interpreting what, you're propose, what you propose. Oh, okay. Thanks for the question. So the uh, I work on electron structure theory, and uh, indeed in quantum chemistry, there's uh, like a lot of things like uh, CAS or other techniques uh, to do this uh, reduction. One thing I want to clarify is that the power of a quantum computer is really allowing you to solve this without that reduction. So you think about you have this uh, many-body n qubit Hamiltonian. Think about this as a Hamiltonian with a like an n creation, a Fermi annihilation operators, and uh, so so the Hilbert space is two to the n. Uh, usually, in on the classical computer, you need to do a reduction of this or that sort. But the quantum computer says, as long as you can encode the initial vector, as long as you can encode the Hamiltonian, you can actually solve the problem as is. And you're actually solving the problem without doing that reduction. So that is really where, uh, at least uh, the promise, well, I, I, to me, like why this is a quite a, a like, like a exciting thing. So um, it's getting late. So one last question. I see Matthew has raised his hand. Uh, sure, thanks. So in your toy example for the A inverse, what you're really solving is A inverse scaled by alpha. So it seems to me that the idea is still that you still need to, once your quantum computer spits out the answer, you then have to push it towards a classical computer to restore that scaling of alpha. Are there other sort of post-processing operations by classical computers that are allowed? Or is this like this trivial scaling the only one? It's actually not trivial. So, so that alpha will uh, matter in terms of the success probability. So, so you might say like I get AX proportional to B. How do I recover that, that uh, AX equals CB? How do I get C? Uh, that C number is also related to alpha that you can do some uh, extra measurement repeating the Monte Carlo type of procedure and uh, to, to get access to that, that C. But uh, uh, once you get this C, what you have access are two, uh, two things, okay? One is that like a C factor, which is stored on a classical computer or you write down in a notebook. The other is a state a quantum state X that's stored in a quantum computer. In order to use that X, you also might need some other procedures. It's not like, I mean, it's only state stored there. You don't have access to any other things. And uh, uh, that's why the readout problem is also very important. Great. Um, I just saw that uh, Jaime also had put a question in, in the chat window that has been there for some time now. Uh, so if, you, if, if it's possible to answer that quickly, does the process to calculate UA tell you what alpha should be? The process to calculate UA tell, uh, uh, th that's true, yeah. So the, the, uh, actually, at least a process, uh, in the case of, uh, of my example, uh, alpha x plus beta i, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, one quarter x plus three quarters i, and there you can estimate alpha explicitly. Uh, and it's, really, it's basically you can get the upper bound through this uh, coefficient and uh, and the kappa definition number. Okay, great. Thank you very very much for a very very interesting uh, presentation.